your first spring refit as a new boat owner is going to become an annual event that you're going to absolutely loathe well if you're anything like me but it's absolutely inevitable like bad weather and you've just got to do it um, it's necessary each year after the winter layup after the boat not being used for the whole of the winter that you check the boat out properly ready for the coming year um, if like me you're not very good at DIY um, I do all the things I can do myself and when there's things I can't do I call for a, pro a professional I get an expert in to do it um, but frankly most of the stuff on the spring refit is the sort of thing that you can you can pretty well do yourself if your boat spent the winter on the hard and I actually think up in northern climates that's the best place for a boat if you can have it hauled out and it can spend the winter with the hull drying out um, and fresh air flowing all around it I think I personally I think that's very good for the GRP so um, one of the first things you can do is to check all the sea valves all the seacocks um, and see if they're free and working give them a twist and a couple of twists and turns and if they're going that's fine if they're not and if you really can't move them and if you're in the water be very very careful um, what you do then you're probably going to need to replace them and that's probably a job for an expert and you need to call a shipwright get the boat yard to do it a quick look at the impeller of course every time you arrive back from a sail you should remove the speed lock impeller and put the blank in and close it up and clean up all the little doobras um, on all the little paddle wheel things on the impeller um, that's what we should do every time we go in and out and sometimes we forget and sometimes we even forget for the whole winter the really big ritual of course of the spring lift out is anti-fouling and giving the hull a polish this starts with having the boat lifted out on a travel lift generally speaking the yard will automatically as part of the deal pressure hose off the uh, pressure hose off the hull and remove the growth from the last 12 months um, and then they'll stand her up in a cradle or with props um, so that you can commence work on her when they're pressure hosing off um, normally they'll do your hull as well they'll do the top sides uh, and if they don't ask them to because um, the pressure hose is really the way to get all the salt and grime off the hull once the boats on the hard standing have a look at the anodes um, you're going to find those you're going to find there is um, at least one anode on the hull and you're going to find that there is at least one anode on the prop shaft if there are no anodes on the prop shaft then um, that probably means that they've worn out fallen off or whatever and I would suggest that you put two on the prop shaft next year or this year if you look at the hull anode and it looks anything like this then obviously you're going to renew it and what I would do is take it off and then you know what um, what size anode what type anode at the chandelers that you need because when you get to the chandelers you'll find there are half a dozen different shapes and sizes and I just always replace it with the same one as I had before with the shaft anodes which screw in they come in two halves sort of like that and they clip around the shaft and you tighten them up um, with an allen key normally or sometimes a screwdriver but generally it's with an allen key um, uh, if you've got the old one then clearly you just take that along to the chandelers to make sure you get the same size if you haven't you get a tape measure out well you get a metal out and you measure what your shaft size is because what the anodes are doing is they're protecting soft metal from um, being attacked by oxidization by being attacked from um, wh when people have their par cables drooping down into the water in the moorings they're running electrolysis into the water and there's a certain amount in all marinas um, all places that you go into there's a certain amount of electrolysis in the water and that will attack soft metals and soft metals are things like your prop shaft and um, the propeller and things like that and what the anodes do is the anodes attract the electrolysis and they get eaten instead of your expensive prop shaft or, expense or your expensive propeller which even after the pressure hose is almost certainly going to be covered in barnacles 
Um, now you can take a scraper to it and that's the hard way to do it. There is a product called um, muriatic acid. Um, there's also a product called uh, Propeller Cleaner from a company called Wessex Boat Store, but I'm pretty sure the Propeller Cleaner is just muriatic acid under another name. Muriatic acid is um, quite a vicious sort of substance, and it really is a time when um, you need to be using rubber gloves, and I would put a face mask on, uh, because you get that in your eyes, you're going to be really unhappy about that for the rest of your life. Um, you also need to have the hose pipe standing by um, with you know a gun on the end of it so that you can start it up immediately. So you get some muriatic acid, put it in a pot and with a paintbrush you paint it onto the barnacles and things all the way around the all over the propeller and that bit of the prop shaft and on the prop shaft if there are barnacles on there as well and it will fizz away and it will fizz away and eat them off. Um, I wouldn't leave it on for more than a minute or two and then clean it off with the pressure with your um, hose pipe with the gun on the hose pipe um, and then do it again basically you can clean up with a little bit of scraping and a lot of muriatic acid you can clean up the whole of the propeller and the shaft very very easily indeed um, and but be sure to wash it off because the muriatic acid will then otherwise start eating your uh, your prop shaft okay so which anti are you going to buy actually almost any anti-fouling works well if you sail every single day. The problem for most of us is that we actually only sail at weekends or we don't even always sail every single weekend and an awful lot of time the boat is sitting there in the harbour getting growth on it and anti-fouling, almost all anti-foulings work with water crossing over the hull and rubbing away. There's the eroding anti-fouling um, if you're traveling through the water, a very slightly m minute amounts, millimeters of it, erode away and keep the hull clean. So that's eroding anti-fouling. The other is hard anti-fouling, which um, works in some of the same way, except it doesn't erode uh, because of the water passing over the hull. It cleans it up. Hard anti-fouling is really popular with people who race. Um, because it means they can have the boat lifted out in the slings and they can have it pressure hosed off, have the hull really really clean before they go in for a race and they're going to go as fast as possible. For more ordinary mortals like me, um, eroding anti-fouling is absolutely fine because um, I sail a reasonable amount and I just, um, I'm not after getting the last tenth of a knot out of the boat, I just want to cruise comfortably and I want my cruising life to be really easy so I use eroding anti-fouling. What you are not going to do absolutely particularly if you're using eroding anti-fouling is you are not going to scrape all the old anti-fouling off back to the hull back to the GRP. It is a total waste of time and effort and labor and absolutely pointless even even if you've got some slight sort of lumps or dents in your anti-fouling I really just recommend that you just paint over it just carry on just put another coat of eroding anti-fouling on and don't go scraping back to the hull which brand of anti-fouling should you use well I don't know I mean uh, everyone has their favorites and different areas of the world seem to use different sorts of anti-fouling the one that I've personally use is um, I use Hempel's Cruising Performance or Hempel's Classic which are actually the same thing they're, I, I, they just seem to have different names in different countries um, for me I find Hempel's products work very well indeed they're not paying me to say this there's nothing in it it's just I think it's a very good anti-fouling and I, I find I get less growth with Hempel's than I do with other sort of primary brands I personally put on a different color anti-fouling each year, um, you know, light blue, dark blue, black, whatever, um, so that I can see how the, um, I can see how it's worn away during the last year. I can get some feeling for, you know, how the anti-fouling has been working during the year, and I think that's quite useful. How much anti-fouling do you need? Well, um, for my 30-foot boat, I use um, it's a Beneteau 323 <coughs> with a fin keel. I use um, one two and a half litre can 
for a coat and there's quite a bit left over at the end of it so for two coats which is what I do um, it's um, two two and a half litre cans I normally put on um, one coat on the first day let it dry overnight or dry yes overnight and then put the second coat. you don't want to let them totally dry uh, because you want there to be some sort of um, bonding between the old coat and the new coat but there does need to be a period in between the two coats so overnight normally works very well indeed um, almost any if you get on the internet almost any anti-fouling site will have a sort of hull description and a length description and a beam description and it will work out for you roughly how much you need. The uh, Before you start anti-fouling you've got to put the masking tape on so you've got a nice clean line between um, the top sides of your hull and where the anti-fouling starts. Um, I personally spend the extra money and I buy um, painter's tape which is a sort of plastic um, it's a sort of plastic um, masking tape the very cheap masking tape I find really doesn't produce a nice line it um, you know I'm not a painter I'm not really very good at these things but I have found that if you use this plastic painters tape for a bit more money you get a really nice clean line when you uh, when you pull the tape when you pull the tape off the other thing is how do you apply the masking tape and what you don't want to do is go along doing it sort of inch by inch along the um, along the line where the old where the old uh, where the old paint was um, a young Dutch shipwright showed me how to do it when I uh, when I had my boat in a yard in Monica Dam and basically sort of fix it at the bows um, put a yeah put a, you know put a few inches in just to just to tighten it on the hull and then walk away for five or six meters and then line it up by eye and by eye lay that five or six meters along the line and you get a really nice straight line doing that and then when you've done that um, yes stick it on a bit and then walk away and do the next sort of five or six meters until you've done uh, until you've done the hull and by doing it in long stretches like that you get a nice smooth line without any uh, wriggles or or curves in it and then you need to thumb it then you need to run down the edge of it and thumb all the way down the bottom edge so that it's um, adhering nicely and tightly and um, there's a transducer there's the echo sounder transducer at the bottom of the hull uh, and I always mask off the um, bottom of that um, you know with a little bit of tape and scissors and just cut round because if you um, if you let too much of, get too much of a build up of paint on the bottom of the echo sounder transducer it'll stop working so well you're going to use rollers rather than paint brushes um, and the little four inch rollers are are best and you can either do it in a tray or um, professionals that I've seen doing it do it straight out of a can um, I, I I always grew up using paint trays so I do it out of a paint tray um, and the little four inch brushes are best I know it seems illogical but um, you get a better you get a better coverage and a better finish using those with the fairly sort of hard rollers on them and they're so cheap and inexpensive you can buy you can buy a load of them although overnight if you stick them in a plastic bag plastic carrier bag um, squeeze it in tightly wrap the handle around with a couple of turns of tape um, the next morning the brush will be um, still be wet uh, because it's been in an airtight situation it'll still be wet and you can use the same one the next morning when you launch when the travel lift comes along and lifts you up where the props were you're going to have little square areas um, which haven't been anti-fouled so when they lift you up in the um, travel lift um, you need to have a scraper standing by so you just scrape that area scrape the barnacles and muck off that area because it probably hasn't been pressure hosed either and slap on as much anti-fouling as you can um, with the roller um, and then also go underneath the bottom of the keel where it's been sitting on the ground like get down on your hands and knees and scrape the bottom of the keel and anti-foul under there as well the propeller um, it's hard I I must admit I do buy 
um, propeller anti-fouling and I do put it on each year and the next year it's never there and I've got barnacles so I never know for how long it's uh, I never know for how long it's worked but I think it's it's quite expensive propeller anti-fouling but I found that if you buy you know if you buy a sort of aerosol tin of it um, even putting two or three coats on the propeller in the beginning of the shaft and indeed some of the shaft um, even doing that um, a tin will last um, two or three years so I guess the cost over two or three years is probably not that bad you're going to want to polish the hull it's important that there's no dust or dirt on the hull before you start polishing so if they've pressure hosed it off you know as I suggested earlier that's absolutely fine you've got a nice clean plastic hull and if not get the hose pipe on it with you know and squirt it down and get it clean by far the best product I think for cleaning the hull is um, a pro it's an American product and I first saw it in America in um, a Miami yard when I was there and now it's sold widely in well, all over Europe and in England and it's called Starbright Marine Polish and it's incredible you don't need buffers you don't need anything like that and it just simply is not you know Americans are very good at making stuff that really really isn't hard work so with Starbright Marine Polish, you um, get on steps or a ladder or a platform that you apply one on the first rag, rub it on an area, I don't know, about a meter square. It dries off almost immediately, get a soft cloth, polish it off, and voila, you've got a nice clean shiny area. And it is so not hard work. You can do, you can do one side of the boat. You can do one side of the boat in a day, less than a day. Um, Besides making the hull look nice, you know, making it look shiny and clean, I actually think it protects the fiberglass. I actually think it stops water getting into it. It stops um, salt getting into it. I think it's very good for the fiberglass to, um, to polish the hull. If I can plug into the mains, so if I can plug into shore power there, so I've got amps going into the battery, um, I normally drop my anchor down and drop the anchor chain and lay it out and I use the opportunity to renew I use little plastic ties um, uh, I use a little black one at five meters and then I use bigger sort of white ones or colored ones at 10 meters um, but a percentage of, depending on how much you've anchored each year uh, a percentage of them are going to be beginning to look a bit tired and worn and battered and need renewing the way it works is the travel lift comes along picks the boat up, trundles it along, puts it over the dock and lowers it, lowers it into the water until you can get on board. They then let you get on board at which point you kick the fenders over the side and you go below and make sure that there is no water coming into the boat, that somebody hasn't forgotten to put a hose back on a seacock that they've replaced or um, they haven't actually replaced a seacock or you haven't for some reason got water coming into the bilges so that's the first thing if you've got a Volvo uh, rubber seal on your shaft you know one of those rubber seals that comes inside when it's now underwater you want to give it a squeeze or a couple of squeezes it's actually quite hard to squeeze it because you're probably right at full length reaching to it until you feel drops of water coming out so you've left what you've let water into this Volvo valve. Give the um, crane operator the thumbs up to say that you're you're happy with all, everything below and you're ready to go. He'll lower the rest of the way and you can start up the engine and make sure check that water is coming out of the um, coming out of the exhaust. I mean you should do that normally anytime. It will take a little bit longer than normal because all the water will have drained out of the raw water cooling system. So you'll be getting water you know the, the the little round impeller um, raw water impeller will be working hard pulling water into the engine so it'll take a moment or two for water to start coming out once water's gushing then you're uh, then you're on your way the guy will then lower the uh, lower the straps down below the height of your keel and you can uh, motor your beautifully clean hull back to the mooring never to see that beautiful paintwork ever again or at least not until the next year 
that evening it's probably worth checking the nav lights check that the navigation lights work the mast headlights work the anchor light works and all the rest of it if you don't do anything else the one thing you must do is to service your engine your marine diesel engine annually let me say something there are excellent shore-based one-day courses on how marine diesel engines work um, they're very inexpensive they're about 100 quid 120 quid 130 quid something like that and if you don't know anything about marine diesel engines and let me assure you I am absolutely not an expert at these things I'm I really had a very steep learning curve when I started uh, long-distance cruising um, so either pay an engineer to service your engine for you or do it yourself understanding how a marine diesel engine works and they're incredibly simple is something which one day will get you out of trouble years and years ago um, I bought this Halfords um, socket and um, spanner set um, it wasn't that cheap but all the tools that you need in order to be able to service your engine oh and buy a multimeter you need a multimeter because that is the fundamental thing for finding electronic faults in the boat the first thing to do and the most important thing you can do to take care of your engine is to change the oil just change the oil every single year it is the one thing that a marine diesel engine needs is its oil changing and it's not that difficult um, firstly uh, you run the engine up so the engine is the engine oil becomes thinner because it's warm you don't want it screamingly hot but you want it warm you want to run the engine up so it's oil and then you get a little hand pump which again you can buy on the internet and you stick one end you take the dipstick out you stick one end down the dipstick like that you put the other end into I don't know plastic bottles big plastic water bottles from drinking water will do you'll need two or three of them and you pump away and you pump the warm old black diesel oil out of the engine into these bottles um, probably need a bucket underneath it all and you certainly need a load of um, certainly need a load of rags or um, kitchen roll or something whatever to keep uh, to keep things clean the next thing you're going to do is to um, renew the oil filter basically these are these are screw on items and you just unscrew it it may be that it's quite hard and there's something called a strap wrench and um, again you can get that on the internet you can get that from Amazon or somewhere but a strap wrench and just strap it around the filter um, and pull give it a little pull and the thing will come loose so you just unscrew the filter drop it into the bucket and then just clean up the area where the filter was you get the new oil filter out of the box and with a little bit of the old oil just uh, there's a rubber there's a sort of rubber ring around the inside of the filter so just um, rub a little bit of oil around that rubber ring the old oil will do the old black oil will do screw it back on um, until it's firm and when it's just you've got it screwed it stops screwing easily then just give it a quarter turn you don't want to over tighten them just a quarter turn will be absolutely absolutely fine um, then clearly you refill the engine um, with um, new fresh diesel oil and that's it you've done the most important thing there is for um, for your engine uh, that's possible the next thing worth looking at is the fan belt um, particularly if there's a load of sort of black dust or dirt around the front of the engine or around where the fan belt is and that if you've got that then it just means quite simply that the fan belt is um, the fan belt slipping and it needs tightening up there should be about quarter of an inch play you should be should be able to just sort of push it there should be quarter of an inch play in the fan belt um, if there's more than that then um, with your new set of correct tools you just slacken uh, the two nuts um, that hold the alternator and insert a piece of wood about that long um, behind the alternator pull it tight against the fan belt and tighten the two nuts up again very very straightforward then you need to change the raw water impeller 
these little impellers have been sitting all winter inside their case and their little legs will be bent over and they're not cheap items these impellers but I, I personally I change mine every year whether the legs are broken or not whether it looks worn or not um, simply because um, it is the raw water impeller that is the fundamental thing that keeps your engine cool basically you undo all the little screws around the bronze facing and I recommend you have a, a little bowl or a cup or something in which to put the screws because you really really don't want to lose them um, take the face of the impeller off and you'll find there's a paper gasket or the remains of a paper gasket in there so take that off and just clean up the area very very carefully don't go scraping or scratching um, the face of uh, either the inside face of the cover or the face of the holder because it's very important it's watertight it's airtight at least well watertight but and airtight because it is the suction of the little impeller running around that draws the water into the engine um, you're probably going to use need to use pliers um, either side in order to pull the impeller out they very often don't come out that easily uh, yes there are, you know if you've really got a problem there are sort of commercial impeller pullers on the market but normally with a pair of pliers you can pull the new impeller the old impeller out the new impeller which you've got will almost certainly come with um, a new paper gasket um, and one way of making it easier to fit the impeller in because you've got to sort of twist it to get it in is to um, rub Vaseline or silicon or Vaseline either uh, around the edges of all the little legs of the impeller and then when you push it in in order to locate it into its slot making sure the paper gaskets correctly fitted put the face back on and tighten up all the little screws and put them back on um, there will be an oil filter around there will be an air filter around somewhere the big things like that in a can um, you just need to look at it you simply unscrew the top take it off and have to get the filter out and have a look at the filter finally there are the actual fuel filters themselves which really do need changing each year there will be one probably on the fuel system which again is a screw on screw off um, affair and again you need to have a bucket of water a bucket or a bowl or something to put underneath because when you unscrew the old filter you're going to get diesel oil popping out all over the place and you don't want it going in the bilges and there may well be a filter on your bowl if you have a if you have a, a fuel filter bowl um, with a glass dome on the bottom of it which enables you to see if there's water um, getting into the, the, the filter then filters water out of the uh, out of the system into this bowl um, you obviously need to drain the water out of the bowl if there's water in there and change that filter the reason that you get water into your fuel is condensation from the inside of the tank when the tanks empty so when you're laying up for the winter it's a, it's a really good idea to fill the uh, fill the diesel tank um, well fill the diesel tank then there is less metal exposed in order to create condensation to create water which gets into the diesel so both these uh, both these filters are uh, you know screw on screw off filters um, and in both cases you just wipe a little bit of diesel around the edge and then tighten it up just like you uh, just like you did with the uh, with the oil filter the problem then is that you have to bleed the engine and bleeding the engine really is not mega at all but it's something that you need a little bit of instruction on there are videos about it and frankly if you do the one day diesel course that's what I teach you is how to bleed a diesel engine and bleeding a diesel engine is a fundamental skill in my opinion for a boat owner there's a little pump this little hand fuel pump on the side of the engine okay it's a, it's a little lever that pumps up and down and it pumps relatively small amounts of diesel fuel around the system so you go to the um, you go to the first joint before where the um, first filter you've changed is um, undo the joint after the filter pump away at the little hand pump and 
diesel will start coming out but it'll have little bubbles in it you uh, pump away the little hand pump until the diesel that is coming out is no longer got bubbles in it and at that point you tighten up the nut and up to there you've got it um, you tighten up the connection uh, the ban the banjo I think they're called connection <coughs> Uh, and there's no air up to that point. You then move on to the next point in the fuel system and you pump away, you slacken off the banjo there, you pump away um, until as uh, the diesel comes out and when there's no air, tighten it up and so on, up the system um, until you get to the injectors. And you're not going to mess around with the injectors under any circumstances. Um, so fine. So that's bleeding the diesel engine. There is a really good hard copy book that is worth every penny of its not insignificant price. It's called The Boat Owner's Mechanical and Electrical Manual and it's by Nigel Calder. It is a brilliant book. It tells you everything you need to know about the boat. It tells you about all the systems. It tells you how to use your multimeter. It tells you how to bleed a diesel engine. It tells you how to check your rigging out. It tells you how to fix a bilge pump. It tells you how to... It is just marvellous. And I would really, really recommend that book. So that's it, really. That's um, the pain of the spring uh, refit. Um, if you can't do it yourself, then pay somebody to do it, if you've got the money. Uh, if you haven't got the money, then learn how to do it yourself. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I've probably made it all sound worse than it is. I, I personally don't enjoy it. I, I prefer sailing to doing things to the boat. But, um, hey, it's all part of boating and it's what you do. So good luck with your first spring refit and all the subsequent ones. And um, hopefully I'll see you out there sailing. Do come and say hello to Golden Hayes if you see her. Fair winds. Oh, and I forgot to say, if you press that subscribe button, I'd be really grateful. Um, but, it, you know, it doesn't really matter if you don't. Bye.